Hello and welcome to yet another CNBC Africa debate uh, with me, George and Dirango, of course, taking a look at issues stemming from Rwanda that could have a ripple effect on the region and the continent. Coming up on the show today, on the 26th of May 2017, the World Bank uh, was hosted uh, by Rwanda in terms of their country office open day under the theme Partnering for Sustainable Growth and Shared Prosperity. Now, ordinarily, the open day is designed to help the public uh, learn about uh, the benefits and the positive impact of many bank finance projects. But since we're focusing on the World Bank, they intended uh, to create a platform for regular engagement and citizen feedback on the support that had been provided or continues to be provided by the World Bank. So in regards to that uh, and uh, economic developments that are happening here, we've got to speak to uh, three panelists within my panel that you'll be seeing over the next few minutes. Alun Thomas, resident representative from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Thomas Kigabo, Professor Thomas Kigabo, chief economist from the National Bank of Rwanda. And uh, from the World Bank Group, we've got to speak to Agassi Mkicharian, who is a senior economist. Let's take a look at how that conversation went. Rwanda is now getting into its third decade of uninterrupted growth and it's not coincidental at all. All of this is obviously due to deliberate decisions and the key partners, the World Bank is one of them. But with all the variables that are constantly being added into the ecosystem and into the economic policies, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, macroeconomic issues, even from a global standpoint, affecting most of the decisions that are made here in Rwanda. It is a fact, definitely, that uh, the progress now from 2016 moving on should be very challenging. So we'll just kick things off uh, with, uh, obviously, Professor Thomas Kigabo. Um, during the last presentation, we had questions from the audience, and uh, one was raised about water and uh, why the World Bank was not in, uh, financing that, and of course financing in different sectors as opposed to this. So on a broader level, we'd just like to understand from uh, possibly the government's perspective or the National Bank's perspective, when you're looking at external financing, what informs your decision to engage all these external partners, so all these uh, uh, development partners, uh, even as you map out your business model? I think what is uh, most important, as uh, um, shown in the presentation, for, for a country facing to uh, keep a kind of stable macroeconomic environment, that's extremely important because uh, this is an indication of uh, about how policies have been implemented, how different shocks have been anticipated, and the, what is the capacity of the country to continue dealing with, uh, with different shocks, as you rightly said. Uh, so I think keeping stable macroeconomic environment is, is very key to any strategy of financing the economy, whatever the source of financing. And uh, as a central bank, I, I think all different policies, monetary policy, fiscal policy, contributing to continue maintaining this stability in terms of macroeconomic environment are very, very important. And uh, in the presentation, I think what has been done in Rwanda, 2016-15, we, we, we had these severe uh, global problems, not only Rwanda, but all countries. But I think what, what we have been able to do and what has to be maintained is the way we have been very proactive. Not just sitting, wait to have problem and the shocks coming, hitting you and the start struggling to have solution to deal with shocks. But I think uh, economic managers, different institutions here in the country which are involved in, uh, in managing the economy have been, I think, quite good capacity of implementing what we call uh, proactive policies in anticipating uh, what may arrive in the tech decision today and uh, try to mitigate the, 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 the impact of shock. So what I, I'm talking about the broad framework in which we can have financing or other policies and be sure that we are uh, going to continue to have a good result and achievement. All right, thank you. Uh, 
now Agassi, uh, Professor Kigabo has alluded to shocks. Of course, um, we saw from the presentation uh, services uh, outperforming at 10.4, going against the norm, and the uh, others averaging at 7.0 and 7.1 between 2015 and 2017. Now, it's, an, it's unfortunate and both um, realistic that African countries are hinged on a food uh, food actually in, uh, dis, de, um, describes most of how our economies will perform. But what happened around that time uh, in 2016, when we look at a 10.4 in 2016, that we can now use as a best practice in the event that food and inflation hampers our economic growth that we can leverage on to push most of our agenda? It service sector growth in uh, 2016, I think, was 7%. Yeah. Uh, it's still quite, quite, quite high. And uh, so for low-income country going forward, uh, services are probably, you know, there is a large room for services to continue to grow. And most of them are related to trade, uh, uh, wholesale and retail trade. And, uh, but consumption is going to drive them. So they're not, they're not be able to autonomously grow exogenously grow because they also very much depend on domestic demand and uh, it's a, it's 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 a, it's a, you know it's defined by multiple multiple factor, factors so um, so what we think about Rwanda as a long term growth kind of pillars so probably tradable sectors should drive the growth and uh, in that context there are also tradable services. So services are not necessarily non-tradable. Tradable. Most of the services are non-tradable, but they are also tradable services. So we see uh, that that's why uh, some of those services may, I have the potential to drive the growth in Rwanda. Um, there was an issue about most of the projections that are given by the IMF and the World Bank and most of these concessional facilities, uh, it, they normally at one point or another contradict what the country analysts are talking about. Some say there might be growth, while the larger bodies say there could not be growth or as expected. So we'd just like to know who are we going with? Are we working with the country analysts? Are we working with these international bodies? Who do we uh, see as uh, on the front line of this uh, information? The reality is, uh, you know, economists are not uh, very good at forecasting whether you're a country economist or an IMF economist. Uh, and um, it's up to the, the audience then to make their own decision. There has been some work at the IMF looking historically at the quality of, uh, of our forecasts. Actually, for Rwanda, for growth, we've actually done pretty well uh, compared to uh, other countries uh, and also other variables. Uh, the current account is one which is notoriously difficult to forecast. And Agassi, in his presentation, made the point that uh, for 2016, we'd expected a, a worse current account deficit than uh, actually happened. Uh, and uh, you know, the performance, or the more positive performance, uh, is attributable partly to the quality of the, of the government policies. Uh, we had talked about the fact that 15 and 16 were difficult years. Global growth was down. Actually, in 2016, Sub-Saharan African growth was its lowest in 20 years. A lot of it dominated by the large countries, Nigeria and South Africa. Um, but even in those circumstances, uh, Rwanda managed to grow at 6% and also managed to sort of turn the, the trade deficit. Um, so it had this uh, exchange rate depreciation, which we had supported uh, because we felt that um, you know, some of the adjustment needed to take place by making inputs more expensive. Uh, you know, we all have to tighten our belts uh, sometime. It's not just taking in new food. Uh, or the encouragement of our wives. You know, we do have to do things ourselves. Um, so there was great exchange rate uh, depreciation. And also there was a slowdown in domestically financed investments. So obviously, if you're getting the money, you'd mentioned earlier, external financing, if, if the donors like the bank, etc., cetera, providing financing, then also that's available then to invest. If you have to look for that financing in Rwanda domestically, and then look for the foreign currency to pay for some of that investment, because a lot of it is imported, then obviously you have to make difficult decisions. Uh, so um, acknowledgement, you know, people have to decide who is the best forecaster. Um, but uh, we were actually quite pleased that our forecast for the current account was not materializing last year because it showed that the government did better than we, than we expected. Right, uh, perfect. Um, okay, I will come to you. Uh, possibly the, the audience can now just start preparing any pot potential questions that you might have. But um, we've alluded to, to the issue on uh, potential risks that uh, Rwanda could face and uh, bridging that deficit, uh, Professor Kigabo. 
Um, we saw last year the projection that uh, Rwanda depreciated 9.7%. You mentioned that in 2017 that would go down to 4%, which we are still yet to understand how that will work out. So that is one question. And number two, we are seeing a running parallel to bridging that deficit. You mentioned uh, earlier on about government securities and, of course, the, the T-bills and the papers. But our finances, the local banks here in Rwanda, we are seeing them with the results that they are churning out for Q1, they are moving a bit further from the government securities. So if the banks themselves don't seem to express that much confidence in the government securities and the papers, what makes us think that the rest of the general public or the international bodies will have as much confidence in our economies? I don't agree that uh, the, the banking sector has any uh, problem with the economy in terms of uh, seeing risk and whatever. Well, when uh, you analyze how the uh, banking sector is uh, ready to finance the economy, you, you need to consider two aspects. The first one is the, 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 the demand side of the economy because the demand for loan in 2016 was lower than what we had in 2015. Banks were ready uh, with uh, enough liquidity to give loan to the economy, but when we have some issues in uh, terms of uh, economic activities, we may not necessarily have uh, enough level of demand for loan. So second, we, we, we've seen for the last, uh, last, uh, last, let me say, last four, five years, uh, growth in what we call new authorized loan is around 20% every year. So I think banks are, are, are ready to continue financing the economic activities, depending on the demand, as I said, but depending also on other, other aspects like uh, macroeconomic stability, uh, as I said. So I, I think what is important here is to consider, uh, you've talked about uh, treasury bond and the bill. We, we, we've seen the, the, the shares of banks in uh, treasury bond and the bill investment reducing seriously to around 30% today from 95 years back. This, this is showing that uh, no banks are also more interested to finance the economy than uh, through treasury bills. But also, uh, I think the development of uh, uh, government security market is very important and seen by the public as a, as a good way of saving their money, making uh, good money uh, in addition to the deposit in the banking sector. So we have very good uh, development. And uh, I think the last issuance of, of Treasury bond support exactly what I'm saying. The, 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 the share of banks was around 10, less than 10 percent. So that, that's very important development. About exchange rate, uh, I'm with my friend here. The, the, the exchange rate in Rwanda is market driven. So even the 4 percent you have been talking about is what we are seeing by putting together all drivers of exchange rate in the market, what we call market forces. On one side, we have, uh, we, we have interesting development in, the, in the export. Uh, we have uh, discussed with colleagues in uh, IMF. We, we are expecting to have export uh, increasing by more than 20 percent this year from uh, 8% 2016. So far what you have seen in the match, because that's the data we have today, we have an increase of more than 30%. So that's one. Second, uh, we have uh, not really big increase in import. Uh, so far in the match we have a reduction of around 10%. Due to different factors, I think uh, made in Rwanda, we have some, we have increase in, uh, in uh, domestic production like energy. We've seen, for example, the import of uh, uh, oil product declining, the, the, the domestic demand of that product, uh, product declining due to increase in uh, electricity. We've seen uh, reduction in uh, imported uh, construction material. So, these factors have been contributing really to uh, reduce pressures on our trade deficit. That, that, that's why we are confident. 
And uh, with different policies, government policies implemented for the last two, three years, we are very sure to have a positive impact on export and uh, on import also. There were some questions in the background. We'd just like to know who's, there's some who had mentioned that they had questions uh, during the break, but uh, are there any now? If you'd like to know how your, how the country will be progressing. Do you have any questions so far? We have two there and one in the back. Uh, it was nice to look at the development of Rwanda and the economic growth, uh, but I, when I was looking at the tables which were presented, I didn't see how much the agricultural sector uh, ref is reflected in the economic growth of this country, bearing in mind around 70% of the people here rely on agriculture and they contribute around 30%. And uh, if Rwanda is to move forward, I think we need to think carefully about how we can harness that sector in the agro processing as well as the export. But also the other thing which I, I, I think Rwanda needs to look at carefully is the large labor force which is coming out of the universities and secondary schools. And we need to think carefully on how we are going to use that sector, not only in the formal, sec the formal employment sector, but also in the in informal sector, which needs to grow at uh, quite a high pace if we have to have an impact in the development of this country. Thank you. I, I think uh, from the presentation, I've seen some discrepancies in figures. Uh, in one graph, you are saying the manufacturing production in the GDP was high in 2016. But in another graph, the people who have been used, the labor, it is 100%, very few. So the production high, people used, very few. So that is the discrepancy. Maybe you are going to help me to understand, sir. Uh, the second question is about uh, uh, the way you are saying now, last year, uh, when uh, you, you have been analyzing the, the portion of the primary, the secondary, the, the tertiary sector. Now uh, it is the tertiary sector, the services, the production is higher than in other sectors. So to me, I don't agree with you, sir, because uh, I've been analyze, analyzing this uh, since uh, 2000. I'm teaching uh, macroeconomics. So I follow the structure of GDP of Rwanda year by year. Uh, what I know and what I knew is uh, when, when you are analyzing the GDP of Rwanda, 40% came normally, it comes from agriculture. Uh, uh, maybe 30% comes from tertiary sector, it means services. And then the last one, it's always industry or manufacturing. So now I don't know what happened. What uh, the government of Rwanda did to change this, this situation. I didn't understand that. Maybe you're going to help us to know what happened in 2016. So that now the agriculture is the last one, services uh, uh, come after, and then the last one is uh, industry. So now, sir, um, personally, when I, I, I do my personal analysis of the GDP of Rwanda, it is uh, it is not good at all. Why? Because when you are doing the analysis of the GDP, the biggest part, the biggest part, as I said, comes from agriculture. But now the the latest, the latest is what is uh, manufacturing. Now the problem is what? Because we don't have enough investors in manufacturing. People, most of people are investing in services. And you said, I saw, I saw in the graphs and the explanations in services. Now in Rwanda, when you are trying to analyze the investment done in Rwanda, it's done in uh, hotels, restaurants, it means services. Now you try to analyze the people who are getting jobs from that uh, investment, there are very few. 
And all of us, you know that uh, manufacturing is the best investment because you can give jobs to people. Now in Rwanda, people, are, when we are looking at these figures, me, I don't agree with them. We, we need to look at the reality. The unemployment rate in Rwanda is very high. Why? Because the, industry, the, the manufacturing sector or the secondary sector does not produce enough. And now, when I'm teaching my, my, my students, I, I ask them, just, you try, and I, I can ask that uh, question to Professor Gigabo. Uh, when we try to analyze what Rwanda today is exporting to ESC countries, is what exactly? Almost nothing. What AESC countries, Kenya, Uganda, and other countries are bringing to Rwanda is a lot. Why Rwanda does not export to other countries? Because of lacking investors in manufacturing. So the problem is what? You can't export enough. And now Rwanda is a, it's now a market of other countries. Now, maybe uh, uh, you, are, uh, because you are working with the government of Rwanda, you need now to see how to motivate people to invest more in manufacturing, so that number one, you create jobs. Number two, you can export. You have markets. You can ask maybe Mr. Uh, 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 who produced juice, uh, Sina Jera. You can ask him, tell us the juice you export to Kenya, to Nairobi. He'll tell you, sir, I don't export. Why? So those are my concerns. When I'm teaching, right. I don't understand the things. Right. The last question, the last, the last, is about the way you collect data. When you talk about macroeconomics uh, issues, they are very sensitive. Because you, the World Bank, use them to, to finance people, to find projects in the country. So do you trust the people who collect data from the field? Because it is very complicated to get data from the field, from a, when you, you are collecting data to know the production in agriculture, me have produced, I've consumed what I produced, and then how can you get the figure, the right figure of what I've consumed when you are collecting data? So, uh, me, my, those are my concerns. When I'm teaching sometimes, I, I wonder, thank you very much. Right, I think we have a lot to digest. Let's just, uh, let's answer those questions first. Uh, yeah, before we get on, now, there are some points that are very arguable. I saw uh, Professor Kigab writing a few down. But uh, I think we should start with uh, you, Agassi, because he directly um, asked about your presentation. Now, you mentioned that some sectors uh, have high productivity level but are not able to absorb labor. I know that is definitely one of the points that he was alluding to. Maybe you could just uh, react to that. And the issue on uh, agriculture as a reflection of a government. There are questions from both Cindy and uh, our uh, latest. Uh. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 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 good questions. So uh, let me quickly respond on data issue. Um, um, I thought something that was seen as discrepancy here. So in fact, uh, I, there was no uh, chart on contribution from sectors. It was growth rate. So it might have created confusion. Apologies for that. And it was showing growth rates. And the other chart where manufacturing was taken as 100, it was relative productivity in other sectors, assuming that manufacturing is 100. Um, OK, so no, more to the substance, the question on agriculture. And uh, I'm sorry for the impression that uh, we, know, uh, we created that we don't care about agriculture. In fact, it's, it's exactly the opposite. And um, we've been talking to government the last couple of days as part of the, you know, the Vision 2050 and what are the areas to focus. And uh, interestingly, uh, when we say that productivity in agriculture is very low, we don't mean that it is not an important sector. It means that there is a large room for productivity increase. And it's even possible that increase in productivity in agriculture will have bigger impact for the economy than simply moving labor from, uh, from agriculture to service sectors. First, because when productivity is up, in agriculture, service has to, labor has to move to other sectors, and it's a good, good thing. And the other one is that agriculture is extremely important for Rwanda because this is the Rwanda's endowment. What Rwanda has has an extremely fertile land and, and, and uh, labor abundance uh, that can work on this land. So this is, this is kind of uh, obvious endowments that Rwanda have. 
And it's very important to start with the endowments that Rwanda has, having also in mind long-term strategic areas where Rwanda is also focusing to. And also agriculture is important because it will provide raw materials inputs for agro-processing and agro-business. This is really very important uh, focus and uh, we know that government is also very much focused on it. And I think it also will be very strongly, I mean, we expect that it also will be strongly highlighted in Vision 2050. Um, on uh, university graduates, uh, we, and, uh, skills are issue in Rwanda, as in many low-income countries, definitely. And uh, univer so uh, universities are not producing enough uh, uh, skilled labor, we know it. It's not about universities, but it's just about the uh, overall situation. But also, we know that uh, also graduates need to go through training uh, to better fit into you know, a job requirement. So these are all ongoing issues, and I'm sure these are important focus of government. And there are uh, the, the development partners who are supporting government with that. The World Bank is very just launching an important skill development project helping exactly to address the questions you're raising. So it's very important in the agenda. I'll, uh, and also uh, talk very quickly about the last set of questions about, uh, uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, manufacturing. So uh, uh, in fact, as, as, as you recall, I mentioned that manufacturing is one of the sectors where there is productivity growth. We are not happy with the fact that manufacturing, being able to grow within sector, you know, improve its performance is not able to attract labor and probably is not attracting large chunk of capital investments. So uh, it's very important to understand why investments are not moving to a manufacturing. That's a very important topic and it's part of uh, our support to go government's work on Vision 2050. There could be all sorts of reasons, incentive framework, market failure, things that government needs to address. And we know that government is very much focused on it. Because as I said, manufacturing, unlike financial services, is a sector where it can absorb labor that Rwanda has at this, at this point. And what Rwanda has is abundance of uh, 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 labor uh, who are able to come from rural sectors and join manufacturing. So that, that, that's the first and important step. Doesn't ma it, 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 it doesn't mean that other steps in parallel trying to you know, uh, uh, boost financial sector it is not a good idea. In fact, it's a very important idea, but that it's kind of two-pronged two -pronged strategy focusing on what you have, and that's all agriculture and the potential in manufacturing. And I think the campaign that Rwanda is doing, made in Rwanda, is exactly addressing this, and there are already some preliminary results. I'll just very quickly on, on data. Data is an issue everywhere, so there is always a problem with data in all of the countries that we work, even in the uh, United States of America. We don't work there, but we know that data is an issue. And um, so uh, we are using different uh, frameworks to understand to what extent we can rely on data. And uh, we haven't seen any major issues with macroeconomic data in terms of sector contribution. And uh, there might be some issues, as in any country, but uh, we know that, for example, the, the trends that we see, and I think it goes to back to the point that Alan made, trends that we see are very much in line with the intuition that we have. So we see slowdown in growth in agriculture. We have slowdown in industry because of construction, because we clearly see it. So we don't have major problems with data at macro level, the question that you're asking. And uh, there could be some deviations, but that should be within margin, so. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Gabo, before we come to you, allow me to just ask uh, Alan about uh, the issue on data as well. I'm keen on uh, an IMF perspective on the same. Okay, well on data, I mean, as Agassi said, uh, it's a difficult subject anywhere. But to be honest, Rwanda has uh, some of the best data in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we had done some work a few years ago looking at the quality of data in various countries. Um, just two highlights. One, you mentioned on agriculture. How can you actually understand when a family has a plot you know, producing 10 different items? How can we measure the yield of each of those items? Well, you know, when I actually first came here, uh, Mr. Manzi worked at, at the statistics, took me out uh, into a little village 30 miles away, uh, and he showed me GPS mapping that they had done of the whole country where they could identify all the separate plots. Um, so it, to be honest, if there's anywhere that I trust agriculture data, it's actually here in Rwanda. Um, now, you know, the reality is, and as you mentioned, you know, the yields have not been that great. Uh, it's a difficult country because the topography, you know, makes it uh, very hilly, um, a bit like my home country in, in Wales, as some of you are aware of. Um, 
So, you know, that is certainly a challenge. Um, but, you know, I can't fault this country on statistics. The same for the GDP. I mean, you mentioned when you were looking at the numbers 10 years ago, uh, the, race, the shares of the three different sectors are very different. Uh, well, you know, Rwanda is one of the few countries that rebases its GDP every three years. Uh, so it looks at various surveys and then assesses, you know, is the agriculture still at 40 percent? You know, looking at latest developments. Well, the reality is that shares come down to 30 and services is pushed up. So on data, uh, I'm a big uh, supporter of Rwanda. On manufacturing coming to Rwanda, that's a tougher nut to crack. I'm sure there are very many debatable points uh, within the questions that were asked. Professor Kigabu, just uh, help us to find some clarity. Professor, you may not understand how this data are corrected. I think this, this is not a basis of not trusting data. So that I think what you need to do is to understand how, what kind of methodology we use. I'll be very happy to share with you different methodologies, but uh, we, we are very, very happy in terms of uh, the progress done, in terms of uh, correcting data in different sectors real sector, financial sector, monetary sector, I think really we have made a very, very good progress. And for your information, and again, I have my friend from the IMF, Rwanda is also among few countries uh, for which data are published by, by these big institutions. After checking uh, the, the quality of methodology and the way, the way we where we correct the data. So uh, I understand your question. You probably try to link what is in the books and the, the real life on ground. So it's not a problem of data, it's a problem of matching the two realities. So I think there is a room for improving uh, um, on the side of professors. The last comment is about uh, different sectors. We have talked about agriculture, manufacturing, I think the presentation was clear about the achievement, but also challenges and what has to be done. I think uh, by, for me, by, by improving, for example, the, 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 the productivity in the agriculture sector, this will create more job in uh, uh, manufacturing, in uh, processing uh, sector. And one of the recommendations of, 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 in, this, in this presentation was the shift in terms of, uh, of a job from agriculture to non-tradable goods, meant in, the, in the services. This shift may be improved by exactly increasing the productivity in the agriculture sector, creating more job in uh, agro-processing, which is one of the key tradable and the productive sectors in, in, in this economy. The, the, the last, the last uh, comment is about what we are exporting in the ESC. I, I think, again here, you just read uh, our numbers in National Institute of Statistics website of the Central Bank. More than 30% of our export are, um, are exported in the region. When you include, for example, DRC and the others, not, not only ESC, you have a big share of our export going in the region. And the numbers have been increasing over years. I think in 2014, yes, I have good numbers. 2014, the share was around 22%. Last year, the share was around 33%. So I, I think it's a, it's a problem of access to information, probably. Three last questions, and then we'll just wind up this session. We have reached the stage of, uh, you know, in the economic uh, cycles, and we'll f we always see that the, the factor productivity will, re will reach a stage where we have to push it up again. Thus, there is a, a great need for, uh, for, especially for the World Bank, to look at the infrastructure support. And uh, everyone 
who assembled here recognized what it has done to the energy sector. But transport, still we need to do a lot. Yeah, as you see, Rwanda is a landlocked country and how to create the mobility for things and people. So definitely we have to invest in air transportation. There is a need to make Rwanda as the hub of air transport for Africa. So my, my question is about what the World Bank is doing towards that one. And, and of course, uh, it's a very important project and coupled with that of railway project. So where, whereby we can bring in, though it is costlier by air transport, but rail transport will help us to have the benefit of intermodal transportation systems. Of course, where we, we can also benefit from the water transport uh, in, uh, in terms of its cost and other things. First of all, we have to break the barriers of landlockedness for Rwanda. So what are, the, what are the, the, the steps that World Bank is having? And of course, we know about what is happening there. Rwanda is very seriously considering the uh, air, air transport uh, project and also the railway project. But it needs the book, big push by the World Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I've been in Rwanda for three years and been working a lot on the relationships between weather, both observed on the ground and weather coming from satellite imagery and the connection between that and tea productivity, for example. So one comment on data is you can get daily data on the green tea leaves that come into every factory in Rwanda. So it's an incredible source of data and that is a very large part of the economy. Um, we can also forecast maize productivity. We could, we could do that with every agricultural crop in Rwanda. So the challenge part here is could we put our heads together and have a very detailed, specific forecasting model for Rwanda that takes account of the agricultural part of the economy, which as we've just heard is what's given rise to the shocks and it's a bit that's you know, been neglected. Um, question over to you is, of all the many models that you've seen for forecasting GDP in Rwanda, which one is the, is the winner as far as you're concerned right now? And you can again give a chance to how we could maybe uh, work together on extending that. As to what is being done, uh, I will start with the roads. Uh, I think the Ngoma Nyanza road project that we have been talking about is one of the final part of the road network that is actually covering this country, linking us with the other neighboring countries. We have uh, the road linking us with Uganda from Kabare already covered, the Gatuna border going also to the border with uh, Tanzania is ongoing, fully financed. And we have the uh, DRC road, both of them already covered, linking us from Rubavu and Rusizi. So the Ngoma Nyanza 12 World Bank is coming in was actually the only missing part that creates almost like uh, the total linkage of the road network li linking Rwanda to the rest of the neighboring countries. And we've Going ahead, I think you heard from the, my colleagues from transport uh, talking about the ring road that is in the pipeline to make sure that we're able to decongest or reduce traffic around the capital city. At the same time, be able to connect all these other road network in the country. But we've also gone ahead to acknowledge that we are a landlocked country and uh, much of the emphasis has been put on uh, investing in the, in the airline industry. Uh, which has come uh, up very fast, one of the fastest growing airline in, the airline in, in Africa. And what we are doing beyond the airline industry, we're also uh, coming up with the next airport. Uh, that came on board because we acknowledge the fact that we're a landlocked country. Uh, we need to embark or to rely on air transport uh, since we, we don't have access to water, which is the cheapest uh, means of transport that other countries are using. And at the same time, as in our next phase of development, you've heard that uh, we've come up with studies for the railway network. However, that takes place, we have to uh, work, partner with our sister countries, our neighboring countries, to work on the railway network to be able to connect from their, their railway line, to also push it can come to, uh, up far to Rwanda. And this is one of the key projects in. Um, transport, 
that we should be, be focusing focusing on in the coming in coming three years once we are done with the airport, which is a really sad construction. Uh, my final comment is on uh, what was asked by the professor on uh, manufacturing versus services. Uh, it's good my colleague, uh, Professor Chigabo, touched on this. Uh, however, uh, I think what was missed by the professor was to look at the trend of the growth of manufacturing in Rwanda. Because in the past 10 years, we're not at the same level with our neighboring countries, and we acknowledge that we've been importing more from the, our neighbors. But if you're teaching in Rwanda, then you know what's going on in terms of uh, the zoning, creating of the industrial zones, the Chigai industrial zone plus the district industrial zones that is, uh, are coming up in Rwanda. All that are aimed at uh, promoting industries, promoting manufacturing. However, we are still of the view that service, promoting services in the country is one of the key areas we've, be, we've, got, we've got to be focusing on as a country. As a landlocked country, services is one of the areas we have to focus on. I'm happy that you talked about hotels. Hotels are some of the areas where government in the past five years put much emphasis because we didn't have them. I think Serena was one of the five-star hotels for a number of years. It was only last year when you had uh, other th uh, three five-star hotels coming up. And maybe that's why people are beginning to say services is coming from hotels. To, to us, is a, on, is a, is a good critique on, on, on hotels. Therefore, we are moving on to industrialize like you've seen from Made in Rwanda pro campaign that is, that is going on, all that is aiming at industrialization. However, the lecturers should be helping us instead to have a clear analysis of where we are coming from and maybe say, if you tell us that the speed at which we are moving is not right, as government would accept. But if you say industrialization is not taking place and you're not following up on the government programs that are going on on industrialization, then you won't be helping us as scholars because we have to rely so much on scholars to understand what we need to be improving as government. Uh, that's what I thought I would add on to what my colleagues have commented on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bona uh, P.S. Um, there were two questions that were raised, maybe as we just uh, try to wind up. There was one from the back uh, in regards to the slowdown and the stage uh, in our cycles where we have to push up that was addressed directly to you. Infrastructure support, also the issue on landlocks and mobility. And then uh, a professor from Carnegie Mellon talked about uh, the forecasting model and what you've noted as a preferential one for the Rwandan context. In, in fact, what describes Rwanda quite well um, is that uh, the willingness to reflect uh, as every, every growth model has certain, you know, uh, it's appropriate for under certain conditions and situations always evolve. And what is unique about Rwanda that we've seen here as, uh, you know, as a, as a personal opinion and also, you know, a kind of remark is that uh, this great willingness to reflect and as P.S. mentioned that, you know, there was a, a lot of investment went to hotel infrastructure and in the last couple of years, and now they're realizing that there's also a need to uh, boost in industry, and this is exactly what's happening. And uh, we know that it's a very important priority for government. So in terms of growth model, every growth model is relevant under certain circumstances and assumptions. And I think Rwanda is uh, looking at the growth model and is making necessary changes, and Vision 2050 is going to be the key platform for that. As for a specific question about infrastructure needs, uh, so it's, um, the connectivity has a multiple dimension. So it's connectivity to the rest of the world, to the region, and also connectivity within Rwanda. So everything is very important. So connecting uh, uh, producers to markets. So that's why our uh, we, you know, the bank has done a lot of work on it and continues to work on it. It's very much uh, related to the first presentation that we had on transport sector. Uh, and it's uh, multidimensional. We address uh, regional initiatives. We address, uh, you know, local connectivity issue. There are a number of issues that the bank is not present, but that's something that the private sector is very important. So the government is working 
uh, to reducing transaction cost of private sector to engage in largest logistics. It's very important because logistics within the country may be also an issue and there, might, there, is a, there, is a, there is a room to improve that, but it has to be done through private sector. But as a, as a general remark uh, uh, in, for infrastructure, and uh, in, as in many countries, uh, and especially in Rwanda, where government was so proactive investing in infrastructure, and it's very nicely reflected in logistic index of Rwanda, which improves substantially. And I think every foreigner who comes first time to Rwanda, they see that infrastructure of, and some key, some key features of infrastructure is very, I mean, in good shape, and it's reflected in logistic infra infrastructure index. And, uh, but uh, I think uh, from now on, it's important for private sector to take on as well and uh, also address some of the issues related to connectivity and the government. We know that government is working toward that. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I think it's wonderful that actually Rwanda has this new center for data sciences. We mentioned earlier that we you know we are uh, very proud of being here and being part of the statistical um, uh, framework here in, in Rwanda, but there are challenges and um, two things came to mind. You're talking about sort of having a good understanding of some of the agricultural um, uh, levels and agricultural forecasts. My colleague Thomas at the, at the bank has been scratching his head in trying to understand uh, what's happening with food price inflation and sending some of his colleagues around town to, to get a better sense of what's going on. So I think you two can certainly collaborate there and uh, help to uh, you know, to improve our understanding of, you know, what is happening in the agricultural sector and how does this link to the, you know, the pricing of markets. And back to the earlier comment, you know, 70% of the people, you know, live off the land. So understanding what's happening in terms of, of you know, potential for food price changes is, is very important. On your other issue then in terms of, you know, what's the best model? Um, you know, the, the, the way that, uh, that we look at, uh, at, at the forecast, we have sort of, uh, Three, three models. So one is based a little bit on what I guess you were showing. We have the sectoral data, so you have the 10 sectors, agriculture being one of them, uh, and then looking at, the, at those various trends um, and looking at you know, input data, et, et cetera. Uh, the other one then is what's called the expenditure view of GDP, private consumption, public consumption, investment, exports and inputs. Um, so that's then an, another way of sort of looking at the, at the economy and sort of predicting these separately and then seeing where there are tensions. And the third one you mentioned was the, sort of the time series element, which would be just taking the aggregates maybe on a quarterly basis and then looking at filters or ARIMA models, et cetera. Uh, the, the difficulty with, uh, with the third approach, or you know, all of them in some, in some sense, is the frequency of the data. So uh, Rwanda is uh, ahead of the game because it has a lot of quarterly data and it also rebases. But the rebasing can be a problem because the latest rebasing went back to 2013 uh, and didn't go any further back. So then if you're sort of plugging in quarterly data with suddenly a structural change in 2013, you know, you can make these changes. But, um, you know, some work maybe could be doing in trying to sort of bring that historical data back each time you rebase, so then you have a consistent series. Uh, that's, that's certainly one, one challenge. But, um, you know, I think Collaboration is really important and, uh, you know, getting together, you know, we all have our own different uh, biases and what we can bring to the table. Um, because obviously better predictions of, uh, of what's ahead of us can help us, you know, react and help us and make policies that will mitigate some of those, uh, some of those effects. Professor Gabo, your final remarks. The side of Central Bank, we, we, we have different models. As, as you know, we, the, the monetary policy is a very short-term monetary uh, policy. So we have developed uh, different indicators, just helping us to understand what is happening uh, in the real sector. But also we have some models which uh, help us to have some forecast on uh, GDP, but also the output gap, definitely. This help us to decide about the monetary policy stance. So we, I will be very happy to have a separate meeting, share with you what we have, and uh, try to understand what may be the way of collaboration. Thank you.
Right now, uh, obviously, uh, we had from uh, 2000 to 2016, we were averaging uh, GDP growth maybe of about 43%, so meaning from 2000 to 2000, about the last 16 years. So we've been on a trajectory ever since. So it's safe to say that the pertinent issues that have been raised, of course, create a bit of context on what needs to be worked on as we continue to move forward. We've realized that it's definitely going to be challenging, but a lot more thought will be put in with uh, the bodies that are concerned with Rwanda's economy. So at this point, just allow me to thank uh, uh, my panel Panelists, Agassi, uh, senior, economist, uh, uh, senior economist from the World Bank, Alun Thomas, IMF resident representative, and Professor Thomas Kigabo, chief economist at the National Bank of Rwanda. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, just let's give a, a warm round of applause. All right, and that's where we leave it. Uh, Professor Thomas Kigabo, Chief Economist at the National Bank of Rwanda. Alun Thomas, a Resident Representative at the, at the International Monetary Fund. And Agassi Mkhitaryan, uh, who's a Senior Economist at the World Bank Group, just giving us uh, their perspective on the recent economic developments in Rwanda and some of the cross-cutting issues that don't make it to the conversational table between the micro and the macro level. Remember, for more on what's happening in the region, the website is www.cnbcafrica.com. Just a quick note that the framework within most of these financing projects focuses on strengthening governance, accountability, and service delivery, most of which we have been discussing on the channel. So we will be giving you a lot more on the same within our daily shows and debates such as this. I've been your host, George Ndurango, or at George Ndurango on Twitter. Thank you very much for watching. Keep it CNBC Africa, first in business worldwide.